Thank you very much, uh, Gary. It was a pleasure to hear you again. Uh, we worked, uh, both worked on the Microsoft case, and uh, I recognize that uh, you apply the framework of the Microsoft case to Google, but uh, this time the facts don't fit the theory. And that's what I hope to explain. Uh, as to uh, Google telling organizations off for presenting rival views, I saw Google's name on uh, the list of sponsors of DLD. I don't think DLD had any request to, to cancel this conference or to cancel Gary, so I think that's a little bit exaggerated, perhaps. Um, anyway, what I would like to discuss today, or this morning, is three legal questions and factual questions which are raised by the Google case. First, is it illegal for a company to improve its service even if that results in rivals going down? That's a question. Let's, I'll come back to that. Second, if Google makes these improvements, does it have a duty to share these improvements with rivals? And if it does, what are the consequences of that? Third, let's imagine the court changes the law and that it becomes required to share improvements with rivals. What consequences does that have? And do the facts in this case fit the theory? And I'll discuss the commission's theory of harm and the complainant's theory of harm. And then finally, can we ignore dynamic competition? We haven't mentioned Amazon, but the key point in this case is that Google is competing against Amazon. If you want to compete in this area, you don't start by cutting out Foundem or small CSEs. Nobody has heard of Foundem here other than that as the complainant in this case. You'd start attacking Amazon and that's what Google did through innovation. So that's what I'd like to discuss. I'm skipping the chronology because you probably already know it and I'm going to deal with the question first, can product improvement be an abuse? Well, I'm sorry that I'm a lawyer. Uh, I often have to apologize for that. Uh, I'd like to talk about the law and the facts, right? So the law in Europe is that companies are required to compete on the merits. This is old case law, going back to the old Hoffman LaRoche case. And uh, that means competing on price and quality, functionality and innovation. That is competition on the merits. And the Court of Justice has made it very clear, most recently in the post-Denmark 1 case, that competition on the merits may lead to the departure on the, uh, from the market of competitors that are less efficient and less attractive to consumers because of price, choice, quality, or innovation. And what we have here is that the price comparison or the, the shopping comparison sites that are the complainants in this case Left, were left behind not uh, because of something that Google did, but because they don't offer functionality in particular that Amazon offers, namely the buy button. And I'll come back to that later. This case law is reflected also in other cases, uh, the old Rackle Decker case, uh, even the Microsoft case, and we'll talk perhaps later during the Q&A session about the, uh, there's an echo, is that uh, okay? Okay. Uh, that um, the differences between the Microsoft case and this case. And by the way, US law and EU law do not differ. So the point is, you are entitled to improve your product even if it hurts your arrivals. So I'm going to talk about five different improvements that Google made that led to this case and that Gary discussed. First of all, Google selects the links that it presents in response to a query on the basis of relevance criteria. You know all the page rank system, which says that a page that is very popular because many other pages link to it is probably very relevant and very good, and therefore that is a page that will likely end up at the top of the search results. And uh, an example here on, on Charlemagne. Now Google is in a constant war of wits with so-called search engine optimization firms who want to ensure that their customers get to the top of the search results. And that war of wits uh, involves sometimes what's called black hat operators who really try to manipulate the search results like buying links or stuffing their websites with keywords. 
and Google, uh, in this war of wits, has to update its algorithm as, as often as 500 times a year in order to stay ahead of these manipulators. Now, the complainants were hit by some of these updates, like Panda, for instance. And uh, so Panda is an example which was mentioned. Uh, it's an algorithm change that was mentioned by complainants in this particular case. Now, the EC looked very closely into this. And they concluded that they will not seek to interfere with the algorithms that Google supply because it says these are good for competition. They ensure that search engines present to, at the top of the search results the most relevant answer to the query. So they looked at it very carefully, Gary, and if they had thought there was something there, they would definitely have nailed Google for it. They decided there was nothing, and nor did the FTC, and I come back to some others too. Second, specialized results. In, in 2001, you all remember 9-11. What happened at the time was that Google, people, uh, Google realized that people were searching the search results about New York and about 9-11 events, and they were not getting the answers they wanted. Why? Because it takes time for a site to get the necessary links and it therefore fresh information, very timely, fresh news reports will not show up or did not show up at the time at the top of the search results. So Google introduced a new signal, freshness, in order to make sure that news results show up at the top when relevant. The same happened with product search. In product search, it's not just relevant what the product is. You want to know the price, the quality, merchant reliability, and stock availability. Those are not general signals. They're not relevant for general search results. So Google created Frugal. You heard Gary talk about Frugal. You also heard Gary talk about 2006 email that says Frugal simply doesn't work. Well, the, what Google did after that email and which Gary did not mention, is it did not respond by just stuffing its own product results at the top of the page. It responded by product innovation, namely the product catalog, which was a radical redesign of the index that underpinned the product search. And therefore, it improved its product, not artificially advantaged its product. And a key point, the EC does not object to specialized search results. The third one, the third improvement, is the so-called one box, or the direct answer. Google realized that there are situations where people, when they search for an address, they just want to have a map. Or when they search for a mathematical formula, uh, they just want to have the answer under the formula. It's better to have that answer immediately presented than to get links through which you have to click in order to find out which one gives the best answer. So Google created this one box. This was subject to litigation, both in Germany, in the Wetterdienstleiter case, and in the UK, in the uh, street map case. And in all those cases, and there is also litigation elsewhere in Brazil, the, the courts found that those were product improvements and that even though that hurt rival weather services, or hurt rival map services, that was not an abuse. And the European Commission has not decided otherwise in this case. The fourth improvement, the so-called product universal. You heard Gary explain that product searches, the specialized search results are stuffed at the top. Well, they are stuffed at the top only when they are more relevant than the general search result, the best general search result. And this was done through something called the Product Universal, where the review was gone through two steps. First, you compare the product uh, results amongst each other and you pick the five best results. And then you go through a next step and you compare that results on the basis of, of real relevant criteria and signals with the best general search results. And these product universals ended up at the top only when they were more relevant than any other result on the page. The commission looked at this very closely and uh, they do not say that Google should not have developed the universal search box or that Google was wrong to rank it at the top. What they do object to is that it doesn't carry rivals. And here I get to the final improvement, and those are the shopping ads. Google started uh, shopping ads already in 2008, 
uh, the so-called AdWords product extensions, where you saw a little picture in addition to the text ad, and in addition, it followed up with product uh, listing ads, and then finally, the shopping units were introduced. Now, the reason why Google eventually then decided to drop the product universal from the, uh, the, the web page and to leave only the ads was twofold. First, if you typed in a search query like digital camera, you got a product listing ad block, a product uh, universal, as well as a set of ads. And these were overlapping and competing and confusing and therefore unhelpful for the user. In addition, Google realized that when advertisers pay for an ad, they have an incentive to ensure that the information in the ad is up to date and correct and complete. Whereas if it is a free listing, which the product universal was, they do not have that incentive to the same extent. And therefore, the results in the product ads were better than the product universal. So Google decided, we'll stick the product ads there. We deprecate the product universal. So the summary, the EU does not object to generic search algorithm changes, to one boxes, to product universals, to product listing ads, and to shopping units. What they object to is a form of discrimination, what they call discrimination. They say Google should treat its rivals the same way it treats its own ad business. They want rivals, the complainants, want the rivals' ads to show up in Google's own uh, product ads, and then the rival would get paid. In other words, some kind of non-discrimination rule. So that raises the question, must companies, even if they're dominant, which by the way I won't discuss today, but uh, Google does not admit, must dominant firm help rivals? Under EU law, there is no obligation to help your rivals. Burda does not have to help Springer Press even if it has a magazine or a newspaper, a regional or whatever, where it might have a stronger position or may even a dominant position. The same for Springer, which in the past has been found dominant. They have no obligation to carry ads for Burda, even in the, in the regions where Springer is dominant. So this, sorry for being a little bit legalistic, but I go to the essence, what is an abuse of dominance? The essence of an abuse of dominance is to create barriers to entry for your rivals, to do something active that hampers your rivals. It is not an abuse of dominance, and the case law is clear so far, passively to refuse your help to help your rivals. Helping your rivals is only required when you're a state business or an essential facility, a utility. And the complainants don't even argue that Google is an essential facility. Certainly the commission does not take that position. The German Bundesgerichtshof came to the conclusion in the Bau und Hobby case that niemand ist verpflichtet zu seinen Lasten fremden Wettbewerb zu fördern. In other words, you don't have to foster competition with your own business. You cannot hamper your rivals, but you don't have to help them. And this came out also in the Hamburg court decision in Wetterdienstleiter and in the Brazilian court in Buscapé. Now let's imagine that the court changes the law and it says dominant companies have to help rivals even if they're not essential facilities. Are the conditions for the theory of, of harm of the commission met? The commission says that Google did three things wrong and these are three cumulative conditions. They favored their own shopping results that resulted in diversion of traffic away from rivals to Google, and that foreclosed the rivals, excluded the rivals from the market. Now, the first thing is discrimination means treating the same thing differently or treating, treating different things the same. Ads are not free results. There is no obligation under the law, I would say, uh, and it makes no sense, for Google to have to apply the same signals and the same criteria to its ads as it applies to its search results. It's impossible because ads are paid. Therefore, the signals to be used for ads are going to be combined with, with the bid that was made for the ad. So it is not possible to treat ads the same as to treat your general search results. And in any event, 
to the extent that the signals are being applied, they are relevant for both generic and the ads, and they are used for both generic search results and ads, like bad merchants or price mismatched. So there is no evidence, I think, that there is favoring because Google is not treating like things differently, it's treating different things differently. Second, to keep in mind, as I said earlier, there is no obligation to carry your rival's ads. So there is no obligation for the Financial Times to take an ad from the Handelsblatt simply because the Financial Times may have a particular strong position in a certain demographic of readers. And finally, price comparison engines can and actually do appear when they have a buy button in the Google Ads. Here are examples from Idealo and Check24 from Germany appearing in Google ad results. So let's go to the second element, so-called diversion. The idea here is that uh, the traffic is diverted from next tag away towards Google, to that particular merchant, merchant that appears. What the reality shows, and that will come up if, if there is an appeal, that the traffic is actually diverted from Amazon and eBay because these things, these, this group of ads, these shopping unit competes with Amazon and eBay. And more importantly, there is no connection, no causal link between what happens to the traffic going to the shopping comparison site and to Google's own site. And you can see that when you compare the results, the traffic, in countries where the shopping unit existed or the product universal resisted with the countries where it did not exist. Say, for instance, here, the orange line is the, uh, the traffic to uh, the um, rival search um, um, sites uh, in a situation where there is no shopping unit. The blue line is in a neighboring country, in this case the UK, where the, uh, the, the shopping unit did exist. Yeah, you see the same for Germany and Austria, France versus Belgium, and there are many, many more, but I can't show them all. Now, you see that the trends are all the same. In some cases, the orange line is above the blue line, in other cases, the blue line is above the orange line, but the trends are the same. What does that mean? That means that the product universal and the shopping unit are not the reason why traffic to rival comparison site engine services dropped off. There are other reasons, and the obvious reasons are Amazon and eBay. There are some other reasons, but none of those reasons the Commission objects to. The third element of the Commission's theory of harm and the complainant's theory of harm is exclusion from the market. Well, in that connection, they themselves exclude Amazon and eBay from the market. And this, in my view, does not make any sense. Because if I ask you all, when did you last buy something online? And I ask you, where did you buy it? Amazon or Google? I can ask you now if you wish. Put up your hand if it was Google. I see no hands. Put up your hand if it was Amazon. Right. So does it make sense when so many hands go up, when I ask for Amazon, uh, and that you'd exclude Amazon from the market? The reality is that Amazon and eBay, and these are German and we have them for all the other countries, vastly outcompete the shopping comparison sites, including Google, which is that uh, blue line together with the other shopping comparison sites. Okay? So in this situation, when they are all vastly outcompeted by Amazon and eBay, why does it make sense to nail Google, which has a market share, which is commensurate to its position down there, for abuse of dominance? This makes no sense. The reason is, of course, that Amazon has, com, does not only offer product comparison and price comparison, but they have a buy button. So they offer something even more useful to the user, to exclude the even more useful site from the market so as to artificially find Google dominant, frankly, in my view, is naive and makes no sense. So, uh, and here's an example of Amazon offering uh, price comparison, product comparison, and so forth. So, I conclude. The product, the theory of harm is not met. There is no favoring. There is no diversion of traffic. There is no exclusion of competition caused by Google. 
The product improvements that Google introduced, which may have harmed rivals, were competition on the merits. There is no duty to share these benefits with rivals unless you're an essential facility. And the EC case is an outlier. The Sao Paulo court in Busca Pay looked at product uh, universals effectively and came to the conclusion that there was no duty to help rivals. The Hamburg court in Wetterdienstleiter looked at one boxes. They concluded there is no duty for rivals, uh, for Google to list rivals. The UK High Court in StreetMap versus Google said there is no duty for Google to carry the map, the rival map. The US Federal Trade Commission, contrary to what Gary may have int intimated, did not decide that Google engaged in an abuse of dominance or monopolization under Section 1. There was, in fact, First of all, only 50% of the pages were revealed by the, the, the Wall Street Journal. Second, there were four opinions from the Bureau of Competition, the Bureau of Economics, the Director of Competition, and the Director of Economics. The, only the Bureau of Competition uh, advised the Commission to look further. The Bureau for Economics and both directors and unanimously the FTC commissioners decided not to pursue this case. Right? There's a reason for that. The reason for that was that they decided that Google, that the evidence showed, the thousands and thousands of pages of documents that they reviewed showed that Google was improving its products. And that is good for consumers. The Canadian Competition Bureau closed the case against Google. The Taiwan Fair Trade Commission closed the case against Google. The Australian Competition and Consumer Committee closed the case against Google. So. I'm not saying that the European Commission should follow what these organizations do, but when all of them, after very, very intense review, close these cases and only the European Commission pursues it, and the complainants persist, you have to ask yourself why. So, in my view, it is because the complainants in this case have ignored dynamic competition. They have ignored what Google's pressure came from. Google's pressure came from Amazon and eBay in this particular case. And what Google wanted to do is to make its search engine results more relevant for users. And even if that hurts rivals, that's good for all of you in your personal capacity. Thank you. Thank you, Lawrence. We also want to give you the opportunity to answer questions by Andrew. Well, now we know why there was an echo, right? Get the joke? Amazon echo. Ah, right. Blah, blah. Uh, I actually never realized that. I, I just, you did that show of hands with Amazon and Google. Um, how, um, how many of you do searches on Amazon? Oh, so I was wrong. How many of you do searches on Google? Was it? What, what are the numbers in Europe, about 94, 95%? That depends if you exclude all the other searches, because uh, you can say that, well, wait a minute, you see, you should keep in mind, you should keep in mind that Google is also a general search engine, so people look for things that are not available elsewhere, but products are available on other sites, like Amazon and eBay and Idealo and so forth. In addition, so it, it is like uh, Google is, you can look at it like a puzzle. Amazon is showing particular pieces of the puzzle and Google is showing more pieces of the puzzle. So it's not surprising that more people search on Google, but what is worthwhile noting is that when you asked how many people searched on Amazon, many people put up their hand. Yeah, that was a very interesting. And be, be, but before we drill down into this, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to be as unwise to take you on, on on legal grounds. I realize that you don't work for Google. I don't work for Google. I'm part of their so, outside council team. But you're here on behalf of Google, right? Actually, no. I was invited in my personal capacity because I'm part of the team. So Google, you cannot hold what I say. All the silly things I say, you cannot hold against Google. <laughs> 
I didn't Only design the smart the things, right? <laughs> when you say smart things, you can hold that against Google. No, that you can hold that you can hold that in support. You but you're kind of. I mean, you're paid by Google somehow. There is a connection, right? Uh, yeah, not for today, but I. Uh, I, uh, <laughs> I, uh, I, uh, I am their outside counsel, and they are not a pro bono client. Just like Gary is paid by his complainants, and I think there are eight or something. No? Gary, that's interesting. Gary, is anyone paying for you to give that spiel you gave today? No. no. Um, well, let me. Okay, you're not here. You're kind of here, sort of. Sort of, sort of. Let's say I'm here, of. my personal capacity informed by what I've read in the decision. Right. Just by accident, you happen to be coming to no, Brussels. No, 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 they, they picked me as oh, yeah, one of their council teams. So, so let, let's just step back. You know, I, Google is an amazing company on many, many different levels. One of the most amazing things about Google is that they originally presented themselves as a different kind of company. We know that, that's clear. From the beginnings in the way they did their IPO in uh, Page and Brin's attitude to business or lack of attitude, and of course the don't be evil uh, tagline that uh, I don't know whether they still use that, but it certainly was very influential in the company's early history. They did present themselves as a company that is different from other traditional corporate companies. Now I know again you're not speaking formally on behalf of Google, but your presentation certainly presented Google as a standard business. What's your opinion on this don't be evil thing and Google thinking that it could reinvent business and represent a new kind of paradigm? Well, this may sound a little odd and I'm now speaking completely personally, but... Um, you mean you weren't before? No, before I was uh, as counsel. Now I'm speaking with, on the basis of my experience. This is not a message or, or anything like it. I have worked with Google from before the IPO. Yeah. Right? I have participated in meetings uh, with the board early on, no longer because you know, at this stage they're so large they don't have outside counsel in that board anymore. But, um, so you were on the board? No, no, I was not on the board. Well, I have had five minutes on the board for a presentation. Oh, I see. Yeah. Right? And um, this was a long time ago. And I've also had brainstorming meetings, I've participated in meetings, I've seen videos of meetings of engineers. And what is unique about Google, and I think that ethos is still there, and which I have not seen with my other clients, they are the only client where an engineer, when presented in a meeting with an idea that fosters their business, would say, that's not good for users. And I've seen this happen time and again. When Panda was introduced, right, you have to keep in mind that Panda uh, took down sites that, were, that, that sounded relevant but weren't really relevant. One of the categories of sites that it took down were so-called content farms. Content farms uh, have articles with kind of silly articles about how to nail, hammer a nail, how to you know, brush your teeth and so forth. And, and they show up in search results. They used to show up in search results. And they were stuffed with ads. And who provided many of those ads? Google. So when Panda went up and these sites went down, Google's suffered a significant income reduction. And why did they do that? And why did they accept that? Because it improved its general search results for users. In the long run, that's a form of, that's enlightened competition. That's, and that, uh, so I don't, I think you, Google is unique and still, even if it's a large organization, has an ethos which I have not seen with many others. A Couple of other questions for me and then I'm sure there are some questions from the audience. Um, in your very interesting presentation, you made the comparison, I think, between Google and Verda and then between Google and uh, the Financial Times. But there, isn't there a bit of a difference between, say, the Financial Times, where, uh, I don't know what the number is, anyone here from the FT? Certainly someone from The Economist. I mean, what percentage of the market does the FT have? Certainly, you know, oh, I can, I'm sure I can define the market such or that they have I mean, what a 60, 70 percent market definition. Well, what sure. about Birda? I mean, what percentage of the, the magazine market does Birda have? Well, I don't know, 15, 20, 25, whatever it has. But isn't Google different in that sense? I know you have this rather sophisticated redefinition of what search is, but the numbers 
that I've read, and I use in my work at least, indicate that over 90% of people who do search in European countries, and this is higher than in the US because of the absence of being in Europe and uh, the absence of protectionism as well, doesn't that make the search engine, the, the Google search engine, different from other traditional kinds of media? So, there's a little bit of, um, let's say, market definition involved. I was going to use another word, I'll, I'll not use Go it. Go and use it. What no. was the other word? Um, uh, wizardry, perhaps. Um, th there's a, anyway, it depends on how you define the market. If you exclude all the specialized search engines, like Amazon, like eBay, like the restaurant searches, the hotel searches, the plane searches, the, um, and if you exclude all the apps, and if you include social, exclude social search, and therefore basically carve down the market into little bits and pieces, you end up with a market where Google is the largest supplier. And the reason why Bing is not the largest supplier is because they did not localize their search until very late. And then they only did it in France, Germany, and the UK, to the best of my recollection. And localization of search results is very important for the relevance of your search results. So the reason why Bing is weak is not because Google pushed them out by unfair means. It is because they did not localize their search results until much later. In the US, where they did localize their search results, their share is much greater. Final question from me, and then I, and I'd love some questions from the audience. At the end of, of your presentation, you suggested that the real reason for the EU decision, you think legally it was wrong, was that there was uh, pressure from Amazon and eBay. How does that work? Was Amazon paying the EU? Were they putting political pressure on? Um, if I said that, then uh, I'm, I apologize because not what I wanted to say. I think that Amazon and eBay are the beneficiaries potentially of what's happening. But that was coincidental. The unintended beneficiary. Oh, I see. I, I, well, why do you think the EU made the decision which you think was wrong? Um, okay, I'm not Commissioner Vestea, so I am not in her mind. I can only look at what I see from the outside and the information may be incomplete. But it's understandable that uh, an antitrust authority would look at Google in the sense that in Dutch we have a saying that tall trees catch a lot of wind. So uh, they caught so a lot of wind. So you guys were just picked on really? Cause you're well, there was the tallest tree in, in this particular forest and therefore it caught a lot of wind. And um, then it investigated. It has to be said that we tried to settle the case with commitments for three years. That was a very serious effort and Commissioner Almunia said that that met the objectives of the commission. Then what happened and is that there were letters from the German and the French government uh, and pressure from the European Parliament. And I think that may have encouraged the commissioner to look at it again, even though the previous commissioner had thought that uh, the case had been appropriately settled. Um, she came to this particular conclusion. It's now up to the court. We accept that. And it's normal practice for the court now to look at it on the facts and on the law and on the economics. Hard facts, hard law, hard economics, no political uh, comments. Hard so questions from the audience. Quick, quick, because we've got lunch outside. <laughs> I'm sure someone wants to ask a question. There must be somebody here. And please uh, reveal yourself. I hope you're not from Amazon. <laughs> Is anyone from Amazon here, by the way? No. Oh, They're no. busy selling I'm, stuff, right? I'm one small startup, therefore I can just... Not in the space, therefore I'm just interested. But you said that you have got... Financial time doesn't have to, ca to carry its competitors. And you had got a graphic where it said it's an HP printer. Hmm. Do you really think that this, are these are competitors? Or, I mean, where is here the connection? Well, of course, Financial Times doesn't carry an ad from the Wall Street Journal. This is what I understand, but that's maybe not exactly Google's stance. Well, so what Google is being asked is to carry ads of their rivals. That's one of the requests. So it is actually exactly that f scenario, which is one of the remedy requests. Um, in order to go into this question, you have to realize what the market is, that the, the market in this, in this area is two-sided. On the one hand, Google uh, offers free search results to attract as many users as possible. On the other hand, 
It offers advertising space to advertisers, to including product advertisers, in order to match those ads to the users and create an opportunity. And of course, it gets paid for the ads. Those two-sided market models are not new. Uh, you have free TV, you have uh, uh, free uh, uh, newspapers on the subway and so forth. That's not new. But on the internet, uh, Google is one of those that offer a platform attracting users to match their needs against advertisers. Now, in reality, why does Google innovate so much? It's because it needs to compete with other websites that also attract consumer attention to match that against advertisers. This is called, in the economics, attention rivalry. It's competition for eyeballs, as it's sometimes called. A, a competition to get consumers to your website so you can match them against ads. So in reality, and this may strike you as odd, but in economic terms, entirely legitimate, Google competes with Facebook, with Amazon, uh, with all these other specialized search engines, anything that's online attracts ads and attracts users in order to match them against ads. Uh, and it offers thereby a good service to the user because it offers a free service which creates huge user benefits. Um, I can give you examples. There was, uh, um, well, uh, if you want to, it's time at all. Well, we're competing with lunch actually, which is the, a real hard one. But we've probably got one more question, anyone? One question from the lady there in the white. And again, please tell us who you are. Hi, I'm uh, Miriam Moll. I'm a correspondent for Focus magazine in Germany. Um, Google is supposed to change its practices until 28th of September. Um, I was wondering what is your suggestion or recipe if Google is to avoid daily fines which can be uh, can, can build up to a big amount of money if, if, if they don't follow the Commission's request. Thank you. So Google has made a proposal to the Commission, and that's publicly known. I'm not going to talk about what that proposal is, because it is between the Commission and Google for the time being. It will become known if... Uh, all I will say is that I hope that, in the end, Google does not have to turn off some of its services, because nobody would gain as a result. Wow, that, they might do that. You mean in the EU, is that... Well, there are various You mean ways. shut the, the engine, the whole search engine down? No, 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 they, no. No, I don't think that they would go that far. But imagine that no agreement is reached with the Commission, um, and Google has to do something to avoid those fines. So one option is to ask for interim measures from the court. Another option might be to shut off the shopping comparisons. Why wouldn't they just pay the fine? They got the money. Uh, if you want to pay the fine, please uh, go ahead. They, 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 are, uh, they are not interested in breaking the law. What they would like to do is to comply and to find a way of complying with this decision while it's on appeal. Uh, and if that's not possible, then maybe there might be interim measures. And if that's, or and alternatively, they may want to temporarily shut off the shopping comparison site or the shopping unit. I'm not saying that that is what Google is going to do. Well, they may be really hope. hurting. You said they really care about consumers. It would be consumers who would be hurt in that, not the EU, right? You're making my argument. <laughs> I'm not sure about that. But anyway, uh, <laughs> that was great. I really appreciate it. Thank that you so much. Pleasure. Thank you.